Good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many people out tonight. Um, I'm Professor Andrew Schelling. I'm the Associate Dean Research uh, for the Faculty. The Dean, John Fraser, uh, sends his sincere apologies, um, uh, and uh, I'm his nervous replacement. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the, uh, tonight to the 2019 inaugural uh, lecture series for the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. Uh, over the period of four weeks, we introduce a record number of eight professors, uh, and I'm delighted to say that four of these professors are women. Um, for those who are new to the inaugural lecture uh, uh, process, I'd just like to explain a little bit about uh, the ceremony and uh, um, why we consider this to be the most, one of the highlights of the academic year. The process of inauguration to professors serves two main purposes. One is an expression of acknowledgement and congratulations to the new professor on joining the elite circle of the university's uh, professoriate. The second purpose, and the whole purpose of tonight, uh, is to showcase the subject and the story of the new professor to the public. It is the maiden lecture of an academic that has been bestowed the highest honour of our university. Just to give you a bit of background, this goes back to medi medieval days when universities were elite live-in men's clubs. Things have changed a little bit. Entry into the club was a public event, unashamedly designed to impress the public and rich benefactors about the need for their continued patronage, ensuring that club members, that's me, uh, enjoyed a lifestyle befitting their status, knowledge and intellect, and free from outside interference. In this respect, not much has changed. <laughs> then professors were chosen primarily for their own uh, financial worthiness or the depth of their pockets of their benefactors. Uh, 17 one million uh, immediately comes to mind, Susan. <laughs> and one tradition was the new professors had to entertain their colleagues at their own personal expense during the entire inauguration period. I'm pleased to say that we now pay for the food and drinks, or at least the dean does, although we know that Goldie's is fairly budget. Promotion to professor is a serious business, it's, it takes, it, uh, and the appointment is, is achieved only after many years of hard work as a teacher, mentor, researcher, writer, and significant services to the local and in, international community. The selection process is very uh, rigorous, and uh, applicants come under intense scrutiny from international peers who have to attest to the uh, appointee having uh, met the required level of uh, international imminence in their field. These lectures offer a wonderful opportunity for colleagues, friends and families to share in the journey that has led to their uh, academic success. I've already met some of the family um, and I, I now know a lot more about Susan. Um, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and it, it's, it's always great to have family here to, to celebrate the achievements uh, I guess um, I can't think about uh, Susan and not think about um, some, some key words that, that sum her up in my mind, things like integrity, perseverance, determination, passion, uh, and, and an unbending focus on the health and well-being of uh, children and families. Uh, so congratulations, Susan. Uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, to be the sixth inaugural lecturer uh, in, in the uh, series. Um, I'd like to introduce and invite distinguished Professor Jane Harding to the rostrum to now introduce Professor Morton. Thank you. A good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure and privilege this evening to be able to introduce Professor Susan Morton. I've known Susan since she was a medical school student, and I can assure you that even then she was not the usual kind of medical student. I've promised her I'll be discreet. <laughs> but we should all know that Professor Morton grew up in New Plymouth, went from there to Victoria University where she studied maths, and after a first class honours degree, actually did a year at Teachers Training College and taught maths for five years. But clearly, teaching high school maths wasn't challenging enough, because relatively unusually at that time, she then applied for and was admitted to Auckland Medical School as a mature student. Here she thrived, while still tutoring maths part-time and looking after 
two young daughters, including taking it a year out in the middle of medical school for her third daughter's birth, a not easy juggle made possible by huge family support and I think a real example to all of us. Now you might think that medical school and a growing family and some tutoring on the side would be enough for most people, but no. It was about this time that I first met Susan when she applied for a summer studentship. And as many of you know, summer studentships are opportunities for students to do a 12-week research project over their summer holidays. And I had no hesitation in agreeing to supervise the student with the rather unusual CV, the remarkable grades and the energy and commitment that were so obvious even then. Susan completed two summer studentships over successive years. They each resulted in conference presentations and publications, which is rare enough in itself. But these were rather more challenging than usual because Susan studied the outcomes of small babies transferred out of National Women's Ho Hospital because of a shortage of beds. And her research that first summer showed that the babies transferred out had worse outcomes than the babies who were not transferred out. She made the mistake of doing a second project the second year and showing the problem wasn't the transfer, it was how they were looked after in the receiving hospital. Now that's not something that's easy for a medical student to present at a conference when the people looking after those babies are in the audience. <laughs> certainly not being a mere student and certainly not when they're six months pregnant. I'd like to think that at least some things have got a little easier. So Susan completed her medical training with numerous awards, best overall student in every year, amongst other things. Despite this, she rejected my clearly inappropriate suggestion that she might possibly consider an academic career and embarked upon her house officer jobs at Auckland training in paediatrics. Fortunately, clinical paediatrics also turned out to be not quite challenging enough and her years of study weren't yet long enough, so she embarked upon getting a real doctorate at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine on a Commonwealth Scholarship. She returned to the University of Auckland in 2003 as a lecturer in epidemiology, while also completing her advanced training, yet more training, as a physician and being awarded the fellowship of the Australasian Faculty of Public, Med Public Health Medicine. It was about that time that there was a call to establish, for applications to establish a new New Zealand longitudinal cohort study. And Dr. Morton led the bid from the University of Auckland and the rest, as they say, is history. Professor Morton now is undoubtedly best known for her leadership of the Growing Up in New Zealand study, but she does have many other roles, including advising several government departments, uh, advice to the, Auckland, the Australian Medical Council, the Royal Society of New Zealand, a council member of the International Society for the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, a New Zealand representative on the International Society for Life Course and Longitudinal Studies, and I could go on. She was made a member of the Order of New Zealand Order of Merit in 2019. She already has more than 100 publications and something over $60 million in external grant funding. So tonight it's very appropriate that we celebrate the recognition by the university of these achievements by her promotion to the highest academic rank of professor. Please welcome me in joining Professor Susan Morton to give her inaugural lecture, A Feast of Famines, sorry, A Feast of Assumptions, A Famine of Evidence. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane, and uh, thank you so much to everybody who's come tonight to uh, celebrate with me and with my family and uh, to celebrate where I came from, which I've, I've got on this slide. Many of you will recognise the beauty of Taranaki, the wonderful mountain and the sea, and the way they are in close proximity, and that's a very special place for me still, uh, somewhere I feel at home. Um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity of growing up there. So when I started to reflect on my journey to this point, 
Firstly, as Jane said, I really never intended to be here, so I feel a bit of a fraud. Uh, and there's many times along the way where I felt like a failed academic, so it's quite surprising that I'm standing here, I think, today, despite Jane's lovely words. And I think one of the other things that is unusual, which Jane has also mentioned, is I've had a very unexpected journey to this point, a very strange path that has led me to professorship. And when I was thinking about how I would share that with you this evening, I stumbled upon this one of my favourite quotations, that life can only be understood backwards, but it must, of course, be lived forwards. And I think that's probably very true for my career. And I hope that as I share some of my journey with you this evening, you'll see that there is a pattern that is easy to see looking back, but in terms of how it was lived, it was very difficult to see in the looking forward. And as a life course epidemiologist, which is what I am now, it's also important that I acknowledge the context of where I've come from at the same time as talking about some of the science and the things that have happened along the way, and some of the things I've been lucky enough to be engaged in over the last 15 to 20 years. So I hope I can share those stories with you. I hope that it makes sense to you in the way that it now apparently makes sense to me, despite my best efforts, as Jane said, to resist ever standing here this evening. So let me start at the beginning. Well, somewhat at the beginning. I guess there are some things that change, and there are some things that don't change so much. And really, yes, I have always been a geek, and I was geeky <laughs> right from the beginning. My first day of school, as you can see there, and my graduation with a pure maths degree from Victoria University, as Jane mentioned. I have always loved mathematics and patterns and numbers. And right from a very young age, if you ask my mother, I saw patterns and things that others didn't and caused great consternation, I believe, outside the butcher's shop when I started counting in twos at the age of about 18 months. So patterns and numbers have always been something that have appealed to me, and I love pure mathematics, and I still do. So I went to Victoria to study pure mathematics because that was my career choice. And I use career rather loosely because I grew up in New Plymouth. I went to a Catholic girls' school. There were 90 of us who started third form, as it was called then, or year nine, as we call it now. I think it's year nine. And actually, there was only one of those 90, that was me, that went on to any sort of tertiary study. So it was actually not that long ago, surprisingly. It was 1979. I guess that is a long time ago for some of you. It doesn't seem that long ago for me. But really, it was the exception to go on to tertiary study. And the career advice we were given was that if you left school at 15, you were likely to be a secretary. If you left school at 16, you could potentially be a primary teacher. And if you happened to make it all the way through seventh form or year 13, as I did with two other colleagues, then you would go on to teach your favourite subject. And my favourite subject was mathematics. So I was compliant back then, and I did as was expected. Most of you will know that that didn't last long. <laughs> so pure mathematics is still a really important discipline for me. And it has been incredibly necessary in many of the, th many of the things that I've done. And I'll show you some of that as we go through, I hope. But as Jane suggested, it wasn't sufficient for me, and I hope I can demonstrate that as we run through the evening. So one of the things that I reflected on was why I did honours in pure maths. And really, if I'm honest, it's because I wanted to stay in Wellington and stick with this guy that I happened to meet 40 years ago. Uh, and really, I didn't want him to get away. So I did honours in mathematics, not because I was particularly fascinated with being an academic, but because I wanted to get married. <laughs> and I managed that too. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> now, another advantage of being married when you're a secondary teacher trainee, as I was, is you got to stay in Wellington to do your secondary teacher training, rather than going to Auckland or Christchurch, which were the two choices at the time. So I did stay, and I was lucky enough to go what was, to what was called an outpost, a secondary school training outpost. Really, it was a prefab. It was a prefab in the back of Hutt Valley High School. <laughs> and actually, it was wonderful, because we got real experience in front of students, and I loved every minute of it. So 
That was really what happened in, back in 1983, I think. Uh, and then soon after, I got a job at Sacred Heart Lower Hutt, so going back in some ways to my roots of Sacred Heart New Plymouth, but in a different city. Now, I was pretty passionate at that stage in terms of teaching that girls could do anything, or as I've said here, actually, I think girls can do everything. And right back then, it was really my goal to show all girls that they could do maths, because so many girls were told that it didn't matter if they couldn't. And I really felt that was wrong. So whether I was teaching the seventh form, the highest class, or actually the remedial third form, which I did as well, I took great joy in trying to enthuse them about what I saw as a beautiful subject. And I did that for about 18 months. And then things went a little bit wrong. So my life plan started to take an unexpected turn. And along came daughter number one. Um, at which point, when I told my headmistress, she screamed and said, how could you, Susan, after she'd employed me and thought that she'd done a good job. But nevertheless, along came Julia. So Julia came along unplanned, and then, because I was home anyway, I thought, well, let's have number two. And I think my husband agreed. And so soon there were two. But in being home with two children, what I really started to recognise is that, as well as thinking about girls and maths and a passion for making a difference, I got involved in Plunkett and Parent Centre. I used to teach antenatal aerobics, so picture that if you will. Uh, it's a long time ago. Um, we won't go there. There are no pictures, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, but what I did realise is that actually maternity services were changing dramatically. This was in the mid to late 80s. And what was happening is that mums were being sent home from hospital with their babies after just two days in hospital, which actually sounds like a luxury now. But at the time, they were being sent home to very little community support. And a group of us were very worried about this. So I became quite an activist, and I would hang out at Wellington Health Board meetings, along with a few of my colleagues, and we would heckle, really, to try and get better care for mums and babies. So those of you who thought that I was meek and mild, it started a long time ago. I'm sure you don't anymore. Down the bottom is a photo there, actually, of our first Parent Centre Christmas, and Julia stands out in the red. So like her mother, she's never been one to follow the crowd. Um, so basically what happened though is that as maybe as part of that community group, maybe not, I got invited to be on a, a working group that was looking at low risk pregnancy. How did we provide for mums having babies who were supposedly had a low risk pregnancy? Quite what that is I still don't know, but at the time that was the title of what we were looking at. And it really made me realise that as well as being a community activist, I really wanted to do a bit more in terms of the health of mums and babies. And I guess it made me realise that my career choice of a maths teacher was somehow not going to last me another three or four decades, and that being a mother was wonderful, but actually it wasn't enough. And so I thought, well, I did want to be a doctor once, so why not try it now? So at the tender age of 27, I was a mature student. I'm not sure there's anything mature about me still, but I applied as a mature student, student to medical school and my lovely husband and family shifted from Wellington to Auckland to enable that to happen. So I came up to Auckland for the interviews. It was quite an eye-opener, I guess. I'd always been someone who was used to doing well at school. I'd always been used to getting what I had applied for. I went along to my interview, and I had two interviews, actually, that spanned seven hours while I sat in the corridor of the old fifth floor of the medical school. Um, and most of that interview questioning was really about how on earth could I do this to my children, and how on earth could I do this to my husband, and why should he give up his career for me? This is 1989. And I think that was a bit sad. Finally, after five or six hours, I was asked why I wanted to be a doctor, which was quite nice. Uh, but by then, I was pretty fed up, to be fair. Uh, I didn't get straight in. I was in on a waiting list. I didn't know until the end of January the next year that I'd been accepted. Um, but sure enough, I was, and I entered the class of 1995. Now, at the end of the first year, I was a little bit unusual, as you've heard. I had two children when I started medical school. 
Um, but I also managed to really enjoy what I was doing, and I had to go back and do first year, which of course people don't have to do anymore with a first class honours degree, but that was what happened then. Um, and actually in my sort of activist way, we, we campaigned against that as well, as well as the interview process, which really wasn't that great if you were classified as a mature student. And now interviews of course are, are much more um, regular for many, many people, and, and a good part of coming into med school. But at the end of that first year, there was another assumption that took me by surprise. Um, I did quite well, a bit better than I'd expected, and a few of my professors came up to me and said, we were really surprised you did so well. You'd been a mum for five years. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's quite special. And actually, anybody that knows me knows, don't tell me I can't do anything, because actually it just makes me want to do it even more. But as Jane said, one of the great things that came out of that first year at medical school was the opportunity to work with her. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to Jane for taking me under her wing at the end of that first year. Basically, I was looking for a job that fitted in with being a mum, and it wasn't easy to find a job that would earn some money and allow me to actually, as I now understand, also start to understand what research was about. So Jane took me on, as she said, in the summer studentship. We did look at neonatal transport between level three centres, and we did it over two years. What Jane didn't say is that that involved me going around the five centres with what used to be called a laptop computer, actually an A3 by A3 box that I used to carry on the plane, and then go and suss out what was going on in the medical records of different centres. But it really did introduce me to research, and I'm super grateful to Jane still for introducing me to academic writing, I think, although still not one of the things I love about standing here. But it was two years, and as Jane said, also led to many other opportunities. And one of those opportunities was understanding about the fetal origins of adult disease. David Barker came to visit the University of Auckland in 1991, I think. And I remember going along at uh, Starship or across the road and hearing what he had to say about how size at birth was related to outcomes later in life. And I thought, this is amazing and slightly fantastic. And I really wasn't sure that I believed him. But actually, over the next several years as I continued my medical training, it was proven that actually this was a real association. This was something that we saw in multiple populations, not just in men, and not just about cardiovascular death, but as in this case, what we saw in women who suffered a non-fatal cardiac events, that size at birth right across the whole population was somehow related to what happened decades later to, to adults. And this was really fascinating for me, and I'll come back to that shortly, because it led to further study in that space. As Jane said, um, I also got introduced to uh, presenting at conferences, and, and she did quite rightly indicate that the time that she made me do it, I believe, uh, given the nature of what had to be said, I was six months pregnant with my third daughter, and subsequently had moved back to Wellington, one of the centres of care that we were somehow saying was perhaps not quite as good as Auckland might have been. I was desperately worried about preterm delivery. I had the Westpac helicopter on standby. My husband worked for Westpac back then. It was quite useful. But actually, she was delivered full term. And so two children became three. I had a year off, and class of 95 became class of 96. The rest of my medical school was rather uneventful. I continued to surprise myself and others, I think, with the way that it went. Here's a photo that was in the Eastern Bay Courier, thanks to Jane for fishing that out of her filing cabinet as well. Sorry, Madeline, it's not the best photo of you. <laughs> we all know you're much more gorgeous than that. But basically then went on and really pursued what I wanted to do, which was to be a paediatrician. I really wanted to do clinical paediatrics, and that's what I ended up doing. I was lucky enough to get a job at Auckland, uh, my house jobs were here, and then I got an SHO job in paediatrics, and I loved every minute of it. But at the time, I took a runoff, so 12 weeks, when my youngest daughter started school, because I wanted to be mum too. And it turned out that at the end of two years, having only done seven out of eight runs, I was not eligible to apply for any advanced training. 
Um, and I was a little bit frustrated with the idea of having to do another full year before I could pursue my clinical paediatrics, which is what I wanted to do at that stage, but it wasn't restricted to paediatrics. We looked at lots of opportunities. So I went back to my mentors and I said, what shall I do? Because as well as that, I also was seeing everybody else's sick children, and I really didn't get much of a chance to see my own, and actually that was really important to me. So I talked to Jane, again, Jane has continued to be a mentor through my whole career, and also Peter Gluckman, who was the dean at the time that I was going through medical school and who had also assumed that I was going to be an academic from a very early time. Of course they were right, um, even though I resisted it, and the lovely Robert Beaglehole, who taught us community health when I was a medical student. Uh, and unusually, I enjoyed that subject, probably because I had some understanding of the context of what it was like to have a family and to be slightly older and to understand what was happening when people presented with clinical problems. So I talked to these three and I said, I'm really struggling with this marriage of motherhood and medicine. Now, what shall I do? And in their wisdom, they said, why don't you do a PhD? That's an <laughs> ideal way to spend time with your children. <laughs> Thank you. So, not only that, they said, why don't you apply for a Commonwealth Scholarship and we'll help you, and they did. They were amazing. So, sure enough, the Commonwealth Scholarship came off. Um, I was put in touch with a wonderful group of people in London, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I planned to do a PhD, and Grant and I packed up the family, having never been out of Australasia, and five of us took off to London in 1998. It wasn't summer, it was winter, and it was very grey and cold. But off we went to London to do a PhD, uh, mostly so I could be mum, not really because I wanted to be an academic, but there you go. So I was lucky to get into the London School of Tropical Medicine, uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as it was called, uh, one of the most preeminent places of public health in the world. Um, and really lucky to there be mentored, really, by an amazing man called Professor Tony McMichael. Um, he is, or was an Australian, um, and he really was at the forefront of challenging what was going on in epidemiology at the time. He wrote a particularly remarkable paper called Prisoners of the Proximate, loosening the constraints of traditional epidemiology. And he really was of the view that we were far too wedded to this idea that proximal risk factors were all that mattered for a particular outcome. He really was much more thinking about the life course already, even before life course epidemiology was a thing. And so I was very lucky to be in his department in London, and also to be in London at a time when social inequalities in health were really at the fore of public health and health research and tackling poverty was also a huge issue. And that was largely due to an Aitchison report or the Black Report that came out in the 1980s and really demonstrated the impact that poor environments in early life had on life course outcomes. So I considered myself very lucky to be at London at a time where all of these wonderful people were also operating and permeating what was going on. David Parker and his FOAD hypothesis had stuck with me, and so my PhD was initially to challenge that hypothesis, because I like to challenge things. And I guess I still really didn't believe that actually what happened in the womb could be written on your tomb, as it said at the time. So I wanted to actually go out and look at whether this was true in non-Western populations. And that's actually what had sat behind getting a Commonwealth Scholarship. However, within two weeks of arriving in London with five of us, and not really anywhere to live actually for the first three weeks either, which was kind of exciting, um, <laughs> I turned up to a professor who was supposed to supervise me who informed me that actually that PhD was no longer going to work, and he was not prepared to supervise me. And I thought, well, that's somewhat disturbing, but, <laughs> but I'm kind of resilient, as you may have noticed, or, or I'm sure you will, I hope you will, by the end of this. And so, with Tony McMichael, actually, he introduced me to David Leon, um, who was quite a junior academic in the London School of Hygiene at that time, but he had just received an MRC grant to revitalise this wonderful Aberdeen Children's Development Study. 
And that was a study that was set up in the 1960s. And he really was interested also in this idea of prisoners of the proximate and understanding how early life events impacted on later health and well-being. So he needed someone and I happened to come along and so that became my PhD, which was wonderful. And instead of actually looking at the FOAD hypothesis and starting with size at birth and how it related to outcomes later in life, I ended up looking at FOAD, if you like, in reverse. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. I do want to just introduce the second man in that picture because in order to do this study, we needed to go and see this gentleman called Raymond Ilsley. Raymond Ilsley was a sociologist and he had been part of the Aberdeen Children's Study when it initially was set up in the 1960s. And he had taken all of the records from that study and put them in his garage in Bath. <laughs> so, and he hadn't let anybody have them. A lot of people had asked, including George Davy Smith, but he wasn't allowed them either. But David Leon and I went to see him in Bath and he showed us his garage and we got the records. I don't quite know why but we were allowed to actually start to unpack these records that had sat dormant actually for nearly 40 years and had this amazing richness about them that I'll show you in a second. The other person that was really important that uh, you see there in a plaque was someone called Dougal Baird. He was a, a medical physician. Uh, he was an obstetrician in Aberdeen and he set up what was called the Aberdeen Maternity and Neonatal Data Bank in 1948. Now this was really forward thinking because he actually set up a database that didn't just capture perinatal outcomes, it captured social outcomes as well. In fact, he sounds like a lovely man but he was a eugenist. He really was interested in social outcomes because he wanted to stop those people he felt should not be reproducing, reproducing. So wonderful that he set up the AMND but not necessarily a wonderful role model but uh, nevertheless I'm grateful to him for his work. So this became my work in London uh, from 1999 onwards and really the purpose was to look at size at birth in terms of an end point rather than a starting point and to look at three generations. So we had information from the uh, Aberdeen Children study that was run in the 1960s that basically collected information on 15,000 children, all of the births in Aberdeen between 1950 and 55. We had their school records, we had their family records, they were linked to the perinatal records through this Aberdeen Maternity and Neonatal Data Bank. And we had information therefore about the grandparents of the eventual children. And then in a somewhat radical move, and I like to think forward thinking ahead of my time, not always the way that I am, we did big data linkage. So for my thesis, we actually used the CHI system in uh, Scotland, the Community Health Index, which is a little bit like the Scandinavian system that identifies everybody in the population. And every person had a unique number that then linked them to all their health records, the Scottish morbidity records they were called. So I basically linked all of the children who were born in Aberdeen, who were part of that original study, some 7,000 of them, with millions of birth records between 1967 and 2001. So you can imagine that there was millions of records and we did probabilistic linkage to recreate their entire reproductive histories. And it was essentially their entire reproductive histories because 95% of the mothers had stayed in Scotland. They were not very mobile. So we tracked and traced 98% of the original cohort. We also sent a postal questionnaire out 40 years after the original study to find out what had happened to all of the males and the females in the study. What did we find? Well, we really did show this old statement from Wordsworth, which really, of course, was about males, but I've turned it into women, that the child is the mother of the woman. Because what we were able to show is quite clearly that reproductive outcomes existed across generations and where there was an intergenerational continuity that we saw. So things like size at birth that we can see here. Oops, let me just go back one. Size at birth that we can see there, according to the size that mum was when she was born, that determined her ability to nourish her own babies. And it shifted the mean, but it shifted the entire distribution. So we're talking thousands of babies here. So there was a continuity in the ability to have babies of certain size. 
Not only that, we saw that mum's size at birth, but also her growth in childhood. And we used a particular technique to actually look at a conditional growth that was statistically independent from size at birth. So my maths was coming back and it was being useful. And we showed that actually it wasn't just mum's size at birth, it was also her growth in childhood, as well as her growth to adulthood, that independently contributed to her ability to nourish the next generation of children. We also showed that gestational age was remarkably similar across generations, and the propensity for miscarriage was also something that was shared across generations. So many, many pieces of research demonstrating how important this continuity across generations and the life course of the mother, not just in pregnancy, but right from her grandmother onwards is, in terms of the next generation. The final outcome of that PhD, I, I guess I rather... Um, uh, called a temporal map, let's just leave it at that. It was, a, it was a way to try and summarise a whole lot of complex information on three generations by this stage, looking at the second generation in terms of size at birth as the outcome, and trying to understand this idea that removed us just from the perinatal factors and took us back to say, what are the things that have impacted on the size at birth of the second generation? And although it's slightly hard to see in this messy diagram, what I really wanted to show you is that, not that, or that, or that, what I really wanted to show you with the right button is that these two are the social class of the grandparents, and these two red lines are the social class of the parents of the G2 infant, the second generation. And what we saw with this mapping is that actually that social class context was taken up in all of the biology that we measured. It was taken up in every measure of growth of mum, whether it was childhood, whether it was adulthood, whatever it was, that social background was having an impact that lasted a long time. It wasn't just something you could adjust for and adjust out. The context really mattered. So that was basically what happened at the end of the PhD to, to demonstrate that there really was some continuity and that life course was important and that we couldn't just... Uh, okay, my screen's just gone off, but this one hasn't, so I don't know if someone can help me with that. That's back. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, as well as that, though, this created a remarkable resource. And we're actually quite good at creating remarkable resources because we've got a whole team of people doing that again now. So this study, Aberdeen Children of the 1950s, as it was eventually called when it was three generations, originally focused on childhood IQ, actually, although we now call it cognition, because that's a nicer way to describe it. And really, the whole study on 15,000 children was designed to find out what predicted low IQ, IQ of less than 70. So out of the 14,900 children that were seen in schools in the 1960s, only around 700 children were followed up. The other 14,000 were just left in the garage of Raymond Ellsley until they were rediscovered and reinvigorated. And basically now there have been many, many studies that have gone on to look at what has impacted on these children's lives right across their spectrum, if you like, of well-being. Not just in reproductive outcomes, but also intelligence, cancer outcomes, psychiatric outcomes, even morbidity and intelligence. So this one really was... Uh, one of Michael Rutter's first attempts at uh, a cognition test, actually, in this study back in 1962. Um, he had a series of pictures that were absurdities, the top line, uh, apparently holding a gun backwards is an absurdity. That's the one you're supposed to pick out. And down the bottom is one that's supposed to be about a logical order. So apparently you're supposed to wash the dishes after you have your dinner, not before. But that was really part of the IQ tests that were administered to these children um, in Scotland. But very rarely used, not used until nearly 2000. So basically, all of the things that we'd shown that were related to size at birth were also related to cognition. And then going on from that, we also were able to show that premature morbidity and mortality, so deaths under 50 years particularly, was also related to the child's IQ or cognition. So basically this, this rich resource that had been recreated and really started well before my time had demonstrated all of these associations, not just with size at birth and diseases later in life, but pretty much with whatever was put into that model. 
So it really was leading into this idea that life course epidemiology was where things were going, for me anyway. But quite before we got there, we left London. We had been lucky in London to live in an amazing place. Uh, William Goodenough House, Willie G, as some of you may know it. Um, Mark Thomas, who was on 9C when I was doing my infectious disease run, uh, wrote a letter of recommendation, and I'm incredibly grateful to the wonderful people we met there. It was an amazing opportunity. We also met some famous people. Yes, that is the Queen, and we met her twice. Um, <laughs> The first time she met my husband, however, she said to him, and what do you do? And he said, I look after the children. And she said, yes, but what do you really do? And he said, I look after the children, you know, that's my wife, you know. Actually, that's quite the story. Uh, we also managed to keep our children well connected to cultural activities, and you can see there the 1999 World Cup which we shan't speak of anymore, uh, was one of the things that we managed to take them along to, and we're lucky enough to uh, get tickets to all of the matches, and we hoped to have got to the final as well, but of course that was not to be. But probably the most important thing was being part of a group of people, meeting all of the wonderful people who were revitalising epidemiology who were really in the space of thinking about life course epidemiology, all the sorts of things that we demonstrated with the Aberdeen study. That actually you can look at one individual's lifespan, but actually in order to understand what is shaping their development, you really need to know about all the other things that are going on for them, all the other contexts and the environments that are shaping their outcomes and interacting with them over time. So this was something that I was incredibly privileged to be part of. I work with all of these people and I'm really still very grateful for the opportunities that that afforded me. Having got into this, I guess there were two other things that had happened just before we <coughs> left London. One was I had decided that rather than continuing to train in paediatrics, I'd changed my mind again. And I really had fallen for public health. I had fallen for the idea that actually social determinants of health were really important and that if I really wanted to make a difference to population's well-being, I should maybe think about being at the prevention end and let other people who were better at it stay at the clinical end. So that was one thing. And the second thing is I'd fallen in love with longitudinal studies because as many of you will know, the UK have an amazing history of longitudinal studies. And I had been lucky enough to be involved in some of them while I was there, mostly around statistical methodology, actually, which is something I'll come back to. So again, getting to use some of my geekiness in terms of maths and thinking about how you think about something that is intuitively simple, like a life course model, but actually managed to model things in quite a complex way, because it's not easy to think about things that are highly correlated, interrelated with the temporal dimension and that affect individuals in the context of multiple levels. So that was something that really appealed to me. And so 2003, five years after leaving, minus one of our daughters who we dropped in Boston, uh, we came back home. Um, and it was a hard decision to come home because Europe was an amazing place. But my family were here and it was important to be back. And I guess I came back with even bigger dreams than I left with. One of them was that I really did want to start a new longitudinal study if we could because it had been a long time since Dunedin and Christchurch, some 40 years by then. And New Zealand was a very different place and is a very different place than it was in the 1970s. What I came back to was a shared job between the Liggins Institute, where Peter was now uh, the head of, having moved on from the deanship, um, and a 50-50 job with community health, where Rod Jackson was. And I found myself as a life course epidemiologist, smack bang in the middle of an argument. Basically, the DOAD, DOHAD hypothesis, as it had become rather than the FOAD, so the developmental origins of health and disease, was very much still about thinking about the early part of the life course and by adult physicians was very much seen as deterministic and something that they were concerned about because actually their belief was that cardiovascular disease was all about adult risk factors. So I tried to be the peacemaker. Life course epidemiology says that both of those periods are important, that all periods in the life course are important, but actually it's not really a concept that's taken on until the last few years. So again, came, coming back to New Zealand was a bit of a shock because I had assumed that everybody was on board with this new phenomenon. 
But as Jane also said, serendipity had it that the week that we landed in uh, Auckland, there was a call for a group of people to go to Wellington to talk about a new longitudinal study. And I'm very grateful for Pete, to Peter for offering me the opportunity to go on his behalf, um, given that he knew the work that I'd been doing in London. Um, and this was something that I really could get my teeth into because I'd just come back from London and I was looking for opportunities at this stage, interestingly, to do research. I don't know how that happened. But I was very interested in research and I was very keen to make sure that if we set up a new longitudinal study it really did some of the things that I'd seen happen in the UK. So this was a call that came out a year later um, along with Cameron Grant and various others at the University of Auckland, we put together a multidisciplinary team um, who designed basically a new study in readiness for when this call came from 16 government agencies. Uh, the HRC led it and they wanted a group who uh, could design and pilot a new longitudinal study. So there was an opportunity to apply this life course epidemiological approach to the study right back in 2004 and 5. This idea that when you were thinking about child development you needed to think about multiple dimensions. We absolutely needed the social environment to be right there integrated into everything we were thinking about. We needed to think about the time dimension, measure trajectories, not just risk factors, the distal as well as the proximal determinants of whatever we were looking at for the children, and think about things as covariates, not just as confounders. And we were interested in the child and dynamic interaction with each of these circles that in this model that we put together we affectionately called our double puddle model, um, and it was the conceptual framework that we put forward when we bid for the right to uh, design this new study. The mind the gap red arrows are really, really important because one of the things that set this study apart, actually even from the UK ones, is it was designed to explicitly provide information to inform policy from the beginning. And we were really interested to understand why well-intentioned policies were not having the impact at the individual level that people expected them to have, and why there were widening inequalities, particularly within our population. So this is a sort of snapshot that we took when we set the study up. We wanted to understand all of these aspects of child development, every single domain that was interwoven with every other domain. So it was deliberate that we wove this like a kite. So it was designed to capture everything that was actually impacting on children's well-being. And in particular, it was relevant to New Zealand because we wanted to be able to understand why we saw inequalities according to ethnic identity. And we wanted to dig beneath this idea that you could use ethnicity as an explanatory variable, which of course is not acceptable and doesn't help us to make change. So this cultural and identity domain, which is continuing to be really important as we set the study up, was a huge part of setting up this study. <coughs> well, we must have done something right because on the 4th of April 2008, some two or three years after we started this process, we were awarded the contract to take this forward. And the study was launched on my daughter's, my baby daughter's 15th birthday, um, which is why I remember the date so well, although those of you that know me know that I remember all dates pretty well, so <laughs> it's probably not a surprise. So we launched it at Tamaki. It was a wonderful occasion. We had ministers there. We had children from the local school talking about what it was like to grow up. And for the first time, it was called Growing Up in New Zealand. There were some things that were also quite surprising on that day, and while for those of us involved in it, we weren't necessarily that surprised that we had got this contract, although we were incredibly grateful, there were many in the community, the longitudinal community, who were surprised. They had assumed that maybe it was their right to continue to lead longitudinal studies, and it was a reasonably brutal introduction for me to the world of academic politics. It continued, actually, and has continued, but that's a whole other story that I won't go into tonight. But it really was also quite a brutal introduction to the challenges of working with 16 government agencies. So this was quite novel in this design, but as well as being a challenge, actually, it has ultimately been a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity to take the evidence that we are gaining from our families and take them to the policy table. So, a challenge, but also an opportunity. 
There were some things we did differently when we set up growing up in New Zealand. It was much larger than the previous studies, of course, because it needed to be. We had a very diverse population in the 21st century. We needed to make sure that we were able to look at trajectories for our children who identified as Māori, as well as our Pacifica children and increasingly our Asian New Zealand children. And also to account for the fact that actually by the time the children start school, almost one in two of them have multiple ethnic identities and they're likely to change those over time. So that was something that was really important. We also recruited dads and we recruited them from the beginning. So we recruited in pregnancy, that was also quite unusual. We used quite an unusual method that got quite a lot of scrutiny but we've spent quite a lot of time demonstrating that that was actually quite a good way to go and actually we're being followed in that regard by international studies some 15 years later. We also really wanted to collect four data collection waves in that vital first thousand days. So when we think back to Dunedin or even some of the early UK studies they would often recruit at birth but then they wouldn't see the children until they were about three. We really wanted to understand what was going on for the children in their first two years of life. And we wanted to be explicit about translating what we found into policy relevant evidence. Our retention rates have been high, like most New Zealand studies have been, uh, but they're not easy to maintain and it takes a lot of effort. Here's just a cartoon to demonstrate what we've collected so far to the beginning of this year. Perhaps a little bit differently too, we collected biological samples from the beginning. We wanted to understand the interaction of genes and the environment, not nature or nurture. So that was something that was very important and is starting to really demonstrate the utility of having rich phenotypes alongside biological samples. And we did data linkage from the beginning, recognising that you could supplement self-reported information with routinely collected admin data, um, in our case with participant consent which has been really important in terms of the whole process and also protecting privacy, which of course for every longitudinal study is hugely important. So what have we shown to date? And I'm just going to summarise very quickly a few of the things that have come out of the study so far. I hope that we've challenged some of the myths that exist about what it's like to grow up in New Zealand and to be a child growing up in New Zealand because essentially that's what we want to do. We want to take this information to the policy table. The first is that we are very diverse. We are a diverse group of children and a diverse population. <laughs> when we took this information in 2010 to Parliament with our Before We Are Born report, there was a lot of hoo-ha really that we had a very biased sample. But actually we know now, particularly after the events of earlier this year, that we are a diverse people. And eventually our future will be much more diverse than it is now. One in three of the children currently being born in New Zealand has a parent who was not. We know that they have multiple ethnic identities. There are 85 languages spoken in the homes of these families and there are 95 ethnic groups represented amongst the 7,000 children. So this is a diverse group of children and we need to understand what makes them well and what makes them thrive. Also their family situations are diverse, different than we might imagine. They live in extended households much more frequently than we think. One in four of them in pregnancy live with extended family, not just with mum, not just with dad, and not just with one parent, as is so commonly thought as the most vulnerable. Only 5% of our children live in that sort of situation. 20% of our children at school entry are still in extended family households. That's important when we think about how we, um, who is influencing these children, what's happening for their wellbeing. One of the things that was said and that we're continuing to look at is that we see far too much mental ill health in our parents in the perinatal period as well as in the postnatal period. So one in eight of our mums had symptoms of depression in late pregnancy, some of which were not being treated. And in postnatal life, one in 12 of the mothers was still demonstrating signs of depression. <laughs> And actually our unique lead maternity care system doesn't necessarily do us any favours in terms of the way that we support some of these families and we discuss that quite a lot in terms of how we can do better. We also showed that dads get the blues. They get the blues more than men of the same age who are not experiencing the birth of a new child. Not as much as the mums but still they get the blues. And if dad has the blues that's not great for mum. If mum has the blues Dad doesn't seem to care. <laughs> it's a rough world. It's a rough world. One of the things that was said 
and is sad is the rate of bullying that was reported by the children's parents at four and a half. One in three of the mums reported that their children were being bullied by their peers before they started to school. Ten per cent of them were reported as being bullied all the way through their preschool period. Now, admittedly, this is mums reporting that, and we will ask the children themselves. But we do know in New Zealand we have huge rates of bullying in our adolescent population. We also know we have unacceptable rates of violence and exposure to violence, and 4% of our children, which is pretty high when you think about the number of births in New Zealand, are regularly seeing the appearance in physical conflict. So we have to ask ourselves, are we tolerating this early, and what can we do about it to change that? One of the things that's also been surprising and that we hope we've had some influence on is the number of families who are renting right throughout the preschool period. So around 40% of our families are in private rentals and there is high residential mobility. Two out of three of all the children have moved at least once in their first five years of life. And around 10% have moved several times, some up to 12 times. That's really difficult when you're thinking about where you put services. How do you support these families? How do you engage with them? And we also then wanted to go beyond that and say, well, what about the safety of those environments? And one of the things that we try and do is to translate this, as I said, into uh, policy-relevant evidence. And so this is a policy brief that we write for agencies, and this was looking at what's the safety like for those children who are growing up in private rentals or even public rentals. And unfortunately, those in private rentals are most likely to move, and they're also most likely to be in the most unsafe environments for children. So no fenced driveways, no smoke, smoke alarms that are working, and so on. Some of this has actually now informed the warrant of fitness, which is great, because we want to see this turned into change. But providing evidence to inform policy, of course, is not easy. We want to move away from this idea of because we understand all the risk factors associated with something, we therefore know what to do. A bit like maths, risk factorology is necessary but not sufficient to make change. And Sir Michael Marmot, also a great hero of mine, set that out very eloquently in a 2010 report where he said, it's one thing to understand the impact of something looking back. But actually, when you try and look forward and understand what to do about a risk factor or how to reduce the impact of a particular health problem, it is a much more complex proposition. And similarly, when you think about using longitudinal or life course information, you also need to use fairly complex methodology. And at the end of the day, turn that into simple messages. And that's a bit of a challenge. One, I guess, that, that I think as a team we're tackling pretty well, but there's a lot of learning to be done yet. Just a couple of examples to wrap up what I mean by some of these things. When we think about population statistics, and we think about things that we think we know about, like poverty, for example, and we see deprivation indices. So this is back when our cohort were uh, before the 2013 deprivation, and we were looking at how many children were living in the highest quintile of deprivation in pregnancy and then at nine months. And you'll see, if you are astute, that the numbers at each of those time points, the cross-sectional points, looks very similar. But actually the thing that longitudinal studies does is allow you to look at the churn and what actually means that 15% or so of the children have moved out and another 15% have moved in. And that's actually really important for risk factors, but also for outcomes. So one of the things that's happening in New Zealand at the moment is a real emphasis on self-control or self-regulation. Based on some really wise and, and good, robust evidence from Dunedin, with a Dunedin study that has shown that measuring self-control at three, and those children who experience poor self-control will go on to have a much higher chance of virtually anything that you might think about in adulthood that is bad whether they're going to prison, whether they're having more cardiovascular disease, whether they're having earlier death, whether they are antisocial, whatever you look at. But when we look at our statistics, what is very clear is that when you try and apply those population statistics and look forwards with a population, it is not so straightforward. So while 10% of the population have abnormal behaviour or self-control at two and at four and a half, it's not the same 10% at an individual level. You can't identify them looking forward. You can only understand it looking backwards. And so therein lies some of the challenge with how to do things 
differently and how to make changes to well-being. We've looked at it with child poverty as well. This is a hugely topical area now, but we looked at this first in 2014. The idea that people experience poverty in lots of different ways and that really it's about a clustering of factors, not the same factors necessarily, but a clustering over time that will make children in particular more vulnerable to the impact of a, a poverty environment or a disadvantaged environment. So we looked at this in terms of what we could see in the first thousand days for our children. And we classified the children as to whether they were experiencing high deprivation, so any four or more of these outcomes, medium, one to three, or none, low deprivation. And we looked at what that meant for many, many outcomes by the time they were ready to enter school. And we saw graphs that looked at like this for pretty much whatever outcome we put at the end. This is about behaviour. Basically, it tells us what we already knew. Persistent poverty is bad, and more poverty is worse. There is a graded effect. Those who experience no disadvantage have a 4% risk of having dis disordered behaviour at 4.5. Almost one in two who experience persistent poverty have disordered behaviour measured at 4.5. And, and you can see a gradient that exists now that's good news in some ways too because if we can reduce the exposure to poverty, hopefully we can reduce the impact of that and not just on problematic behaviour because we could put obesity in there, we could put literacy, we could put numeracy, we could put any outcome that we wanted there and see the impact that this is having. But there's something more special about longitudinal studies and that is that while 44% of those in the most persistent space are experiencing issues, more than half are not. More than half are thriving, and that's what we wanted to look at. What creates well-being? And that's something that we can do really well with longitudinal studies that we can't always do with other information. So we looked at some of those factors. And interestingly, they're things like support, they're community engagement, they're having good friends, they're actually having time to spend quality time with your children. They're things your grandmother probably told you about that were important in terms of time with your children and what mattered. But the strength of numbers of these 7,000 families told us that was the case. That was what was creating resilience. And as well as taking these things to the policy table, we took this to communities, not on our own, but in partnership with other agencies, and said, what do you think about this information? What can you do with this in your community to actually enhance wellbeing for families that are really struggling? And basically, we came up with loud libraries we came up with spaces in libraries where young families could gather, they could come together, they could support each other, they could tell stories, they could sing songs, they could read books to their children, they could have people come to them instead of them needing to go to other services. And so far it looks like it's having a really good impact in South Auckland, but we are still measuring that. And there's lots more to do in that space in terms of using the information for good, in terms of what works, not just what doesn't work. The last thing to talk about is, is one of the other things that we look at, and that's the mind the gap. Going back to that red arrow that you may remember on the double puddle, basically when we look at who is using current services and we match up our growing up information with some of the routine data, we see an inverse care law clearly demonstrated. So those who have the most need are using the services much less than they should be, those who have medium need are using it well, and those who have less need are actually interacting more than they should, probably, when we think about their level of need. So we're seeing a gap. Now, this is with universal services like the Well Child Check, like the Before School Check. Kuldeep's here, he's just done a project on this, looking at it, and it's wonderful to have students who look at these things. I'm really excited about the idea that we're growing a whole body of students who are interested in this sort of work. But he's just demonstrated how our most vulnerable families are much more likely to be missing from our administrative records, particularly in childhood. And if they're missing, then any strategies we develop based on those are likely to widen the inequalities. So as Michael Marmot said again, it's not enough to have universal strategies, we need targeted as well. We need a proportionate universalism that actually turns this inverse care law around and actually finds ways to engage with those who have the highest need. So, 
A quick tour of some of the things that have come out of growing up. Um, an amazing opportunity for me, an amazing team that I work with. Um, we're now hearing the voices directly of the children, which is really, really exciting. We've just finished the eight-year data collection wave in 2019. We're now looking at adolescents, at connecting with the children themselves, transitioning from the idea that their parents tell us about how things are for them, and listening to the children as they get their own voice and emerge in their own independence. Um, they're differently connected than any generation before, and that creates real challenges, particularly for old people like me. But we're determined to do it, and we're really excited that we have such a great platform to do it with. Probably we're following now in the footsteps of the UK studies as well as the New Zealand Dunedin and Christchurch studies. There's an amazing book that if you haven't or if you have anything to do with longitudinal studies and you want to read about it, I thoroughly recommend this book. It's £9.99. It's a bargain from uh, Helen Pearson who writes for Nature in the United States and she wrote a book on the Life Project looking at the 70,000 people who'd been followed in all of the UK longitudinal studies over 70 years since 1946. And she basically said how amazing it was that just following ordinary people's lives could lead to such extraordinary findings. And I really hope that in an era of big data that we don't lose sight of how important these studies are in conjunction with some of the things we can get from our other rich data sources. The other thing that Helen Pearson said is that the people who lead these studies are somewhat mad. <laughs> She's probably right. <laughs> She also said that it takes a team, and it does. None of this is possible on my own. None of any of this journey was. It is really important to acknowledge, firstly, the children and the families. They are what make it possible to stand up and to present this body of evidence that you've only seen a piece of this evening um, and take it to the policy table and try and create a better future for them, but also for all of our children. And I'm really grateful to the enormous support from all of our team, not all of whom I could get on this photo or these pictures. I hope I've embarrassed some of them. But there are many who have been involved in this study from the beginning, and I really am grateful to every single one of you because it does take a team to run something like this. It's not something that can be done alone. It also takes a team to uh, support <coughs> mad escapades like mine and a life course journey that was not normal or expected or predictable even. Uh, this is a lineup of my grandmother and her siblings. We like lineups, as you'll see in a minute. There are many of us. Uh, and my grandmother left school at 12. Uh, this is my mum and my dad and my other siblings. Yes, I'm the oldest, you probably guessed. Uh, and mum left school at 14 um, to support her family. And actually, they are amazing women, supported by amazing men, I might add, as well. Uh, and really, they have uh, been undeterred and supporting and unconditional in their support for everything that I've done, and I'm incredibly grateful to all, each and every one of them. And here's my mad cousins, not all of them. These are some of my first cousins, also lined up. We are a big family, watch out. I hear that uh, Andrew's already heard about some of the things that have gone on. I will keep the rest of the family away from you. Um, but actually, a bit like some of the study findings, you know, connections matter. And those relationships are what make it possible to do some of these things that are uh, slightly odd. And then my own life project, my beautiful girls, who have grown up in my uh, living my life without any choice. Um, I hope they have learned to follow their dreams. And then some things don't change. <laughs> 40 years ago, windows on Wellington, we were so grown up, 18. <laughs> uh, we thought we were. Uh, this lovely chap has uh, stood by my side throughout all of this, and I'm super grateful. He had his own challenges 10 years ago, and his resilience has been remarkable. I couldn't do it without you. So... That's probably enough. <laughs> I can't speak anymore. Uh, I just want to thank everybody who's helped me on my journey. Uh, it has been unusual. Um, as I reflect on it, it potentially makes some sense looking backwards. It certainly didn't looking forward. 
Um, I didn't travel the usual path, and really that has made all the difference, and thank you for listening to my journey tonight. Thank you, Susan. Uh, we've been privileged to a, a fantastic uh, presentation today. Um, we felt the sense of, of the passion for a reluctant academic, the many changes in your career, changing several times, but always that determined focus on following your heart. Your strength of character sh uh, shines through, um, and you, I think most of us uh, feel privileged to hear about the fact that you've been able to do research that's re really changed people's lives. It's world-changing research with real-world impact. So I think we're all very privileged to a fantastic presentation tonight. I'll also be uh, discussing with the wellness committee that they are looking for a new aerobics instructor. So, uh, <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's my final duty to, uh, to, to say thank you again. Uh, and to encourage everybody to join together outside uh, with uh, drinks and nibbles uh, and to carry on this, this wonderful celebration of, of Susan's academic career. So thank you again, Susan, uh, for your great presentation tonight and uh, superb presentation. And congratulations to her proud family uh, for um, allowing uh, um, to share Susan with us and uh, making great contributions to the faculty. So congratulations again, Susan.